Hey, this is Jody with WeldingTipsAndTricks.com. What I want to do today is start part one of TIG welding basics. In this part one of the TIG series, I'm going to do a big, big overview. So I'm going to show you lots of different applications where TIG welding is used. Some of them you knew, some of them you may not have thought about. And then I want you to ask questions in the comments section of this YouTube video. And then in the next following parts, I'll try to answer those questions along with doing the ABC 123 series on TIG welding machines, torches, electrodes, different material types, different techniques, different positions, all that stuff. So this is going to be the big, big overview. And remember, ask questions in the comments section. I'll try to address them throughout the series. Let's go. Well, let's talk first about the most simple type of TIG welding, the most basic kind of TIG welding, scratch start TIG. So basically, here's the setup. I've got a stick welder here. It's an ACDC Miller Thunderbolt XL, a, bo a bottle of argon, a regulator flow meter, an air-cooled TIG torch with a valve, an inert gas hose coming out of the flow meter here, and the torch, the torch is connected with this little adapter thingy here, and then to get power to the torch, typically you just take the stick electrode holder and clamp it there. Now there are plastic guide guards, whatever, sheaths that, that can go over this thing for safety's sake, but you know, this is just, I'm just showing you how, to, how it's uh, usually done here. Air-cooled TIG torch with a valve. Turn the valve on, weld, finish welding, turn the valve off. You got to remember, you're live all the time at the electrode. You, you know, you got power there all the time, so you can't just set it on the bench or stick it in your pocket. <laughs> Not a good idea. In the hands of somebody experienced with scratch start, TIG, it's very surprising the quality of work that can be done. But at the same time, there are limitations. You're, you're strictly limited to stainless steel and steel. You might do a cast iron repair in a pinch, but crack sensitive materials like cast iron don't like it when you snap out of the puddle suddenly. So, you know, you're just better off all around if you can, if you can afford it to get an AC-DC TIG welder with high frequency start. Okay, I've set up a little mock-up weld here. This is very common joint that you would find on a handrail or on something like a roll cage. And it's just inch and a quarter Schedule 40 pipe, so it's about 140 thousandths wall thickness. Scratch start TIG would work just fine on this, and it's often used on stuff like this. But like I, I, I've said many times before, the problem isn't starting, it's stopping. And when you have to whip out like that, you lose argon coverage momentarily, and you have to go back in with a file or a grinder and brush it and shine it off before you start back, or if you weld to it, it's not a problem on some materials. Carbon steel, it's not a huge problem, but stainless steel, you lose your shielding, and uh, it can be a problem, especially on some food service type stuff. Even though scratch start TIG is used a lot for food service. Now I'm going vertical uphill here, and uh, TIG welding is affected a lot less by gravity than MIG or stick welding, just because of the puddle is much smaller, much more controllable, and also you're just generally using a little bit less amperage than you are with MIG or stick. All right, one trick to keep from having to lose your coverage when you come out is to put a piece of copper toward the end of the weld when you're using scratch start. If you really need a good clean area, you can pull the arc over to the copper like that, let the metal solidify, maintain a little shielding, and it works a little bit better. Another area where scratch start TIG is still used an awful lot is in pipe welding. It's used a lot on pipe welding tests like this 6G test. I'm coming uh, up here with a hot pass on uh, 6G. That's the second pass over top of the root. And the reason it's used for testing is because it's used in the field so much. So they test with the same stuff that you're going to be welding in the field. It's used in the field because it's portable and simple and cheap. You don't have to have a separate welder for everybody. Like if you had a uh, Mac Star for everybody welding on a job, they would probably walk off the job site. Another place is is uh, that scratch start is still used a lot is sanitary stainless tubing for dairies and food and beverage type work. And generally, no filler metal is used except when it you know absolutely necessary. And the reason is you could introduce oxides with the tip of the filler metal and they could float to the inside of the root pass like that and screw it up. 
a really quick commercial here. Now I've had a lot of people ask about a bigger TIG finger that they could fit two fingers in or just somebody you know that's got really big fingers that can't fit in a regular TIG finger. I have the TIG finger in the XL version now available at weldmonger.com. Alright let's talk about Lift Arc DC TIG. Simple Lift Arc machines. This is a good example. This is a Miller Maxstar 150 STL. STL stands for Stick, TIG, and Lift Arc. Now the way this little Miller Max Star works is when you when you touch off the machine senses that and then it turns the argon on for you with a solenoid inside the machine and then it bumps the amperage up so that you can establish an arc so normally you're holding a very low amperage uh, so it's a little bit safer as opposed to scratch start when you pretty much got a live tip all the time you scratch it like a match or another trick instead of scratching the tip is to swipe the tip of the rod against the electrode while it's close to the base metal and then sometimes even flip the rod around like a drummer flips a drumstick you know to avoid any any possible contamination on the rod so swipe the rod flip the rod around a trick used by a lot of old-time pipe welders when they're wanting to pass x-ray tests now a little 150 amp machine like this can weld some pretty thick metal by using multiple passes but you have to keep in it within the duty cycle. Let's talk about lift arc multi-process welders now. There's a lot of those out there, and this is one of them. This is a thermal arc fabricator 252i. It's capable of doing MIG, TIG, and stick. Runs a nice, nice stick puddle because it's got some settings like uh, hot start and dig function. So it runs a really nice stick bead, which is kind of convenient because sometimes you just need to do stick. I'm using the Lincoln Excalibur 7018 here, so it uh, does a really good job. Also, welds pretty good on MIG. Being able to have that in a job shop along with DC Lift Arc TIG is can can be really helpful. Now, again, this machine is a Lift Arc TIG, and it came with a, a torch control, which I've never really been a fan of. A torch-mounted uh, amperage control it just doesn't give you the control that a foot pedal does. You can use a foot pedal with this machine, but anyway, either way, you can maintain shielding on a piece of stainless steel like this. Now, I've got this in a little purge box where I'm providing shielding to the back side, but I want to maintain shielding on the front side, too, until it cools so it doesn't turn all gray. Let's talk about high freak start DC only machines now. Now high freak start, I've taken the ground off of this so you can see what that high freak start looks like. It's kind of like a spark plug. It jumps an arc gap so that you can establish an arc without having to ever touch the electrode to the part and that is a good thing. Now here's an example of a, of a machine like that. It's very affordable. It's an Everlast 160 STH stick TIG high freak. And so for little small parts like this where you don't want to have to touch off and drag the part uh, around the table, if you don't want to clamp every part down, like if I had a hundred of these to do, I wouldn't want to have to clamp each one down to the table. I just want to lay them up on a backup block or, or a, a piece of copper and start filling up holes. And little tedious little jobs like this, you would jerk that thing all over the, the table again by having to touch off to it. So high frequency start is definitely a plus and 160 amps is enough to do a lot with. I chose this little project here with a scrap piece of two inch round stock welded to a one inch handle just to show how thick you can weld just using multiple passes and by putting a little bevel on something every now and then where it looks like it needs it. You can usually get a stronger weld just by doing a little joint preparation, a little chamfer here and there to get deeper penetration. TIG welding is only going to penetrate so deep no matter how much amperage you use. So 160 amps will weld almost anything and I'm putting a second pass on this just because I don't want a hammerhead flying across the shop when I'm whooping on something. Alright and then actually this little hammer project what I did is I overlaid the face of it with silicon bronze. That's something else you can do with a with a DC high freak start unit like this is you can do some delicate artwork using a silicon bronze rod. In this case it's not artwork, it was very functional. I wanted a softer face of a hammer and one that I could uh, hammer on stainless steel parts without you know risk of uh, you know contamination from from the carbon steel. And these units are very light, very portable and pretty darn capable. Very simple. You got TIG stick function and you got a lift arc and high freak function because there are some areas that you uh, don't want to use high frequency like around computers and, and uh, maybe automotive stuff where you might damage some circuits 
or some computer chips in there. So it's got amperage and then post flow, and that's it. That's all the settings on there. Now, these machines will also stick weld, which is really handy to have a portable machine like that that, that just you can actually throw it you know, in the trunk of your car or on a, using a shoulder strap or whatever, and they'll burn a 332nd electrode like this 7018 all day long and will burn a, a 1 8th. I don't know how long that, that you can burn a 1 8th, but I burned several of them without the machine ever ever timing out. And they got a really, really smooth arc, especially if you use a, a good rod like a Lincoln Excalibur 7018. Slag will just come right off if you got the machine set right. So on a job like this with a lot of lap joints, where you have to stop and start and stop and start to you know to limit distortion being able to stop and start with high frequency start without touching the part is a big help it's going to help the part look a lot better in the end and will also just it'll just go better and you can avoid distortion by being able to stop and start at will one construction job where the the uh, test was given using a high freak DC machine with a foot pedal and and actually all the welds on on the job site were done that way and electricians came and wired you in a new machine whenever you had to move to a new location but that's that's pretty darn rare but having a high freak with a foot pedal on a root pass like this I would choose it every time as opposed to a scratch start it just gives you that much more control that much less filing and grinding when you have to stop it's just it's just better it's just that uh, you know some jobs it's just not possible just not offered but it sure did help the root pass go in good on this one next up is just very basic AC DC TIG inverters like the entry level type machines these are kind of uh, I don't want to say dumbed down but they basically have a lot of the controls preset inside the the machine so the diversion 180 there is doesn't have AC balance doesn't have AC frequency doesn't have anything it's just got amperage and material type selector the Everlast uh, power tig 185 micro I think it's called on the left has AC balance as well as AC frequency and you can stick weld with it and you can swap out torches whereas the diversion that torch is hardwired in I definitely prefer to have an AC balance setting because you get you encounter all kinds of different levels of oxidation and corrosion and things with aluminum jobs and I'll show you that in just a minute but these these two machines performed pretty well both of them have enough amperage to do pretty thick steel using multi-pass and also with the aluminum they'll weld up to probably you know three sixteenths of an inch before you have to start thinking about adding helium or something to the mix to extend the uh, the uh, capability of it Let's talk about full featured AC DC TIG welders now and I'm really talking about inverters here because that seems to be what I get a hold of these days here's three of them that are very similar in capability they're both around the 200 amp range there's the Miller Dynasty 200 DX the Lincoln Invertech V205 T and the Everlast 210 EXT all of them are around the 200 amp range all of them have pulse and AC balance and AC frequency adjustment P also has all those features and is also quite a capable machine. They're all laid out slightly differently on the touch panel and touch panels are getting smaller with more and more features so a lot of the settings are in the back end where you have to hold the button and let it let the, let the display blink and then set something but you can do a lot of things. You can pulse TIG on thin wall aluminum tubing. Now, on this particular clip here I'm actually pulsing manually with the torch switch at about 0.7 pulses a second and do the same thing if you had to do a lot of these joints you wouldn't have to worry about pressing the switch on and off all the time but I'm just experimenting here with a little technique I've read some stuff about guys pulsing with the torch switch and so I figured I'd give it a try and actually it works pretty darn good also you need to be able to weld really thin stuff sometimes and having a full featured TIG inverter AC DC that most of them most all of them go down to 5 amps some of them go down as low as 1 like the Dynasty but um, 5 amps is low enough to light up on a razor blade pretty much and they're all capable of welding really thick stuff now I'm welding some really thick 4140 here high strength alloy steel it took a 500 degree preheat but I'm only using 160 amps and that is because I'm complying with a procedure that called for 160 amps so really I could probably do this job with one of those uh, smaller machines believe it or not like that little 1 160 STH 
Definitely would want to use a high frequency start though on this low alloy steel because any arc strike could, could, could make for a little hard brittle area and that could be a problem. I'm using a little technique here called a lay wire technique. Oftentimes you dip the wire in and out of the puddle to create that little stack of dimes effect, but you know it's just not always necessary and sometimes seems like a lot of wasted effort. So on something big and thick like this, especially because I'm going to come across this with a second pass so that I can get an adequate weld size to comply with the drawing, there's no point in taking the rod in and out and doing anything. I just put two passes on it. Also, with TIG welding, sometimes you add filler, sometimes you don't. I'm adding filler on this edge joint. This is two pieces of, of thin 18 gauge sandwiched together, and I added a little rod there. But sometimes there are applications where you don't add rod. And you can just get by with just a little fusion pass like this. The word is autogenous. I never, always hated that word, so uh, I don't use it much. Having an AC-DC TIG inverter with high freak start and AC balance really helps on a job like a boat prop repair because aluminum that's been in service of any kind, whether it's marine service, fresh or salt water, is not going to weld as clean as, as a sheet of aluminum right off the shelf. And, and being able to set AC balance as well as AC frequency would, is a big, big benefit on a job like this on like an edge weld. And you can see I used a little piece of copper to kind of back it up and trap the argon on that. And that reminds me of some pictures uh, uh, one of my viewers sent me a while back on this wheel repair. Now, uh, an automotive aluminum automotive wheel is not going to weld the same as brand new material either. But he did the same thing. He backed it up with a with a piece of uh, a copper and just took his time, bead after bead, closed that thing up, and then welded it from the other side, blended it off, and a good repair. There's a lot of times in job shops when you have to do weird stuff like there could be a chunk of metal missing here that the the, uh, the end mill went crazy and and cut a big chunk of, of a part out and uh, you get you just have to put it back and so I'm using a big chunk of stainless for backing here I've got an awful lot of metal to fill in there but it helps to not only trap the argon and help that aluminum weld cleaner but also it helps contour the bead when you use backing now I wouldn't advise using sheet metal backing here, it would probably melt, but this is a big chunk of, of a stainless steel round. And I'm keeping an eye on it to make sure it doesn't melt, but just by welding bead after bead after bead and kind of welding hot enough to where the, the metal rolls all the way down against the backing makes a job like this go pretty well and it actually didn't take all that long before I had welded both sides and then had something that would would have been able to put in service. Now this is just a piece of scrap that I pulled out of the dumpster, out of the scrap dumpster just to show, but oftentimes jobs are just not welding two pieces of metal together, but building back metal that's gone. This is a magnesium gearbox and that's like a hundred beads on there done by an expert magnesium welder, Vinny Briganti. <laughs> but that is some good work and the way you get good at that it, it, one way to get good at it is by doing something I call the aluminum drill and that is just get a piece of eighth inch thick aluminum and run beads and figure out all the settings on your machine play with the AC balance play with the frequency use different tungsten preps add metal often spread your ripples out wider go right hand go left hand and then you'll get you'll just increase your skill dramatically by welding aluminum and by intentionally doing different things purposefully. Now one area where you really need AC balance is on aluminum castings. They can weld like mud and like a mushroom field. And if you can't adjust your AC balance, there's just not a lot you can do other than weld clean, weld clean, weld clean, and hope it cleans up. Whereas adjusting the AC balance to more cleaning action can often make a big, big difference and make it weld nice and clean like this. Also with a TIG inverter, you, you, with, uh, with pulse capability, you can take advantage of what I call the rule of 33. 33 pulses a second, 33% on time, 33% background. It makes that puddle stand right up at attention, makes, you, makes it stay where you put it, especially helpful when you're welding near any edge or welding on an edge. Now you can see with TIG welding, most of the time you feed rod from the other side and go in the other direction, but 
you know there, there's always an exception to the rule and I'm using that I'm using 33 pulses a second here and welding backwards to weld a bead on an edge of a piece of 18 gauge and there's also weird things that you might want to do with pulse I'm, I'm using alternating current here and one pulse a second welding with aluminum bronze on carbon steel and you're going to wind up finding situations where you wish you had a few more amps and a cylinder of helium with a Y can really help. Ying helium in at around 50-50 can let you weld a lot thicker stuff than you normally would be able to. Also lowering the frequency, if you have frequency adjustment, low, actually lowering the frequency can put more heat into a big thick aluminum part. This is why that tip of that electrode looks so funky because I've got it down set on 50 hertz. That's even lower than a transformer machine at least in the USA <laughs> but it really helped do this really thick one inch thick aluminum part by dropping that frequency down to 50 and by adding helium to the mix and adding helium to anything over an eighth of an inch just helps period alright another area where a 200 amp machine really excels is, is uh, for doing chromoly tubing in motorsports or aviation now for that you don't really need pulse but it can really help. I'm just using a straight current right here. The metal's clean, the fit up's pretty good, no, no real problem, but in situations where you have any gap at all, you can revert to that rule of 33, 33 pulses a second. Everything's set on 33, and it will fill a gap in easier than without it. A look right now at that rule of 33 using this HTP TIG welder. I'm going to weld right now right next to the edge and you can kind of see of course it doesn't look like 33 pulses a second but that is that is an effect of the shutter speed of the camera it looks a little bit different to the human eye than it's actually looking here but you get you can see the how the puddle is staying where I put it it's not wanting to wick over the edge of that corner and that's because I've got pulse on now I could this could be done without pulse but I'd have to really 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 pay attention really watch that puddle and even then it might you know wick over and roll over the edge but with the pulse it just makes it go a little easier same thing here on a, on a part maybe that's got a chamfer knocked on it that shouldn't maybe it was a mistake it just helps to put that metal exactly where you want it and makes it stick makes you can kind of uh, get a bead profile that's favorable to something that's going to be machined off later like if this was going to be decked or milled off to a sharp corner that's about the kind of bead that I would that I would want on it series on TIG welding we're going to go into TIG torches gas lenses all kinds of different cups but the stubby gas lens will take a 17 or a 26 torch which is pretty big and make it a lot smaller and make it more maneuverable and I really like them so in just a minute we're going to use this gas lens I'm going to weld on the edge of a piece of 16 gauge aluminum I'm doing that is just to show you what a benefit it is to use an inverter to have a sharpened electrode be able to adjust the frequency I've got it set on 120 Hertz here it makes that bead point right on the edge and also having that gas lens provides good coverage for me over an edge like that also welding down in a corner like this with aluminum it's hard to make it go into the corner sometimes but by using a tapered electrode and increasing the frequency up to 120 or even 200 it really drives it in there all right, well, let's talk about TIG welding techniques just a little bit, and mainly just two different ones for now. We'll get into lots of different ones uh, later in this series, but walking the cup versus using a TIG finger or freehanding. Walking or wiggling the cup looks something like this. It's not always permitted. Like you can see in this close-up shot, this polished stainless now has all kinds of little scratches on it, and that is a bad thing sometimes in certain industries. They don't want anything on, that, on a polished surface. But... In this particular case, this, this, all this metal is going to be remachined and that shaft is going to be turned down to a smaller diameter. You can even see some knurling on there. All that will be turned off and this weld will be machined into a radius. But I'm doing two passes on there by walking the cup and that worked out really well. But this works really well too. And the reason for the TIG finger is after that, about half of that first pass, this thing is pretty smoking hot. So I wouldn't want to rest my bare TIG glove on there for very long without it, you know, maybe an inch or two I could, but uh, it gets pretty hot pretty fast. So I'm using a little bit different technique there, dipping the rod in and out, just going in kind of a straight line, 
dipping the rod and then I'll come over that with a little weave pass just like I did when I was walking the cup and you can see a little close-up of the uh, the uh, the technique used here in just a minute I've got the TIG finger propped and I'm basically just mimicking the same motion that would would be walking the cup so I'm kind of like wiggling or twisting the TIG finger a little bit and it's nice and slick so on stainless like this it really slides along just about like it should and if I when I wiggle it it just makes the torch wiggle just like this and wind up with something that looks a whole lot like I had walk the cup on it industry you're in you may not ever get a chance or need to learn how to walk the cup but oftentimes you need to be able to put multiple passes on something with TIG and oftentimes that thing is gets really hot after that first pass so this is just using a TIG finger kind of trying to make it look like walking the cup and the same thing here now this isn't really meant to be a hammer you over the head TIG finger commercial but that is how I support my video habit so if you've been getting hot pinky fingers and hot knuckles and blisters and everything you know what I'm talking about so if you think this would help you with your TIG welding, by all means go to weldmonger.com and learn more about them. Pick one up. I think you'll be glad you did. Also, make sure to remember to leave your questions in the comments section so we can try to cover them in the coming parts of this series. Please hit the thumbs up button if you like what you saw here and hit that subscribe button if you want to make sure not to miss any of the following uh, segments on TIG welding.